Let's bring in former Secretary of State Condoleezza Rice. Wonderful to have you here today on this particular day. Quite a day, quite a day. Um, in fact, I was thinking you would have been my first call if I was White House Press Secretary. Madam Secretary, what do you think is going on? So now I can do that here. What is your assessment of what happened? Well, uh, Dane, I've seen a lot of strange things in studying Russia and working with this is one of the strangest. Um, indeed, we now think perhaps um, the U.S. intelligence knew that something was brewing inside the Wagner Group. Uh, Russian intelligence must have known that something was brewing. They keep people inside of all of these units who are loyal to the Kremlin. That they didn't do anything about it uh, before it reached this fever pitch is really quite uh, strange to me. It's also uh, this deal. Uh, I was listening. Uh, Americans were surprised by this deal. Everybody was surprised by this deal, including, I think, Russians. And now the problem for Putin is he ha has to explain why, after going on television in that five-minute address, rather alarmist address about how it might be 1917 all over again and we were going to crush them and they were treasonous and then you make a deal and so i think one reason you haven't heard putin speak to this is they're probably trying to get their story together as to how they're going to justify what has happened here as i recall putin's always been worried about this yes is that right this is the kind of uh, russian dna to worry about the revolt uh, they've had multiple revolts uh, against the Kremlin throughout their history. The most famous, of course, the one that Putin referenced in 1917 that brought down uh, first the Russian Empire and then the Soviet Union. And so uh, there's always this concern uh, that there will be a mutiny. And of course, they had the mutiny against Gorbachev in uh, August of uh, 1991. So this is not unusual. He's been worried about it. He keeps a Praetorian Guard to protect himself. Uh, but again, uh, he really set this in motion by allowing this, this uh, back and forth between Prigozhin and the defense minister and the chief of the general staff, by allowing a, an armed militia within the state that was not controlled by the state, uh, and then sending them off into Ukraine and Syria and other places, taking advantage of their brutality, but now having them turn on him. It's, it's like a Frankenstein, Dr. Frankenstein having created this monster. A few people suggested maybe this was all a ruse, that maybe Putin planned all of this. What do you think of that? Well, I, I think it probably gives them too much credit. I, I, at one point, I thought, could this be staged? But you wouldn't stage something, I think, that makes you look so weak. So weak. Uh, because really, dictators, uh, authoritarians, rest on three uh, principles. One is there has to be fear in the population. Secondly, you have to look invincible. Third, there can be no alternatives. Well, this has exploded all of those mm -hmm. for Putin. It also has exploded his myth that the Ukrainian special military operation could take place without any effect of, on Russia, without any effect on the Russian population, and that it was a just and necessary war. Probably the most damaging thing about this is that Prokhorjian said what has been unspoken by those who have supported the war, that this is actually a war that did not have to take place where hundreds of thousands of Russians did not have to die, where a million people didn't have to flee the country. Uh, that, to me, is the most damaging thing that Prigozhin has done. If you could have forecast in the future in the war on Ukraine, what does it look like for you? Well, I think the Ukrainians might have hoped that if this had gone on longer, maybe you would have had defections among the Russian soldiers and so forth. But we'll have to wait to see what it does to the morale of Russian soldiers uh, as the word spreads. And it will spread, thanks to social media, uh, among these military bloggers. How in the world could Putin have done this? Um, we'll see what effect there will be on, on Russian morale in the field. I will say the Russians seem to have been pretty well prepared for this uh, uh, counteroffensive. They're better on the defense than they are on the offense, digging trenches, mining uh, the territory. But uh, we'll wait and see. Uh, this, is, this can't be good if you're a Russian commander out there with these uh, young soldiers. Indeed. All right. We're going to have more with former Secretary of State Condoleezza Rice. She's coming right up. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit more about what's, stake, uh, what's at stake for our children uh, following that disastrous national report card from last week. Brett? Alarm sounding far and wide over education here in the United States after the nation's report card shows math and reading scores for 13-year-olds have plunged to their lowest levels in decades. Let's bring back in former Secretary of State Condoleezza Rice. You wrote a book about education. I know you think about this not only for the children of America, but America's future, yes. America's national security, and the competitiveness that we have to maintain with our allies. Right. Well, this is a devastating report. Um, I think it's a national uh, crisis, and I actually think it's 
it's a national humiliation that we've gotten to this point. Um, we need to really address this and address it quickly. Uh, one of the ways that we can address it, though, is to give parents, particularly poor parents, better options. And so uh, school choice ought to be a question for every yep. presidential candidate. Are you willing to give to poorer parents the same choices that parents who can move to a district where the schools are good and the houses are expensive or to send their kids to private schools? Why don't Poor parents have those choices. This ought to be a clarion call about charter schools. So we've just had a major report out of the Hoover Institution, uh, where I'm director, by our education group led by a, a research fellow, uh, Mackie Raymond, that talks about the fact that charter schools have done relatively well during this period of time. Mm -hmm. Now we know that uh, the COVID really deepened our already significant problems in K-12 education. If we don't do something about it now, we are condemning uh, generations of kids uh, to unemployment and worse. And oh, by the way, we're undermining our own competitiveness because all of that innovation and creativity uh, rest first and foremost on having skills in the population. Just so that everybody can see it here, that uh, reading, reading went down four points, math went down nine points. That's between 2020 and 2023. What happened then? COVID, of course, and schools being shut down. Also, 14% of students report reading for fun almost every day. That goes down every year, and that really breaks my heart because that does help a lot. The other thing we're expecting this week is a decision by the Supreme Court on affirmative action in schools, and you are, of course, affiliated with Stanford and the Hoover Institute. Uh, here's a poll here conducted March 27th to April 2nd saying that 50% of people disapprove of selective colleges and universities taking race and ethnicity into account in admissions. This is an issue that's been going on for a yeah. long time. Yeah. This was a case that originated with some Asian students frustrated with Harvard right. in particular. Right. What do you think should happen here, or what will happen even after the Supreme Court? Well, um, this has been going on for some time. California actually passed a statute uh, as a, as a uh, the population didn't want to see preferences. Look, I'm a limited government person, and um, I would like to see universities maintain the capability of constructing a class. It's not always just about your SAT. It's about uh, where did you come from. Uh, I know universities, whatever this ruling is, uh, we're going to have to continue to put together classes classes that are diverse, and I don't just mean ethnically diverse. Right? I've never been one, one from column A, one from column B, one from column C. The kind of quota system seems wrong to me and quite un-American. Uh, I do think, however, that we need to take into account uh, background and circumstances. I'm third generation college educated. Had I had kids, my fourth generation college educated kids would have had an advantage, even though they were black, over first generation uh, kids who didn't have the same opportunities. And so universities, I think, are going to have to be creative uh, to put together classes that are diverse ethnic ethnically, diverse in terms of socioeconomic status, mm -hmm. diverse geographically, and diverse in, set in terms of the skills that uh, the kids have. But um, I understand uh, the, the pain that the parents who um, actually put forward this case must have felt, mm -hmm. um, and it has to be addressed. Mm -hmm. But let's do this in a way that keeps our classes uh, diverse across the whole spectrum of diversity. Did you see the back and forth between President Obama and Senator Tim Scott last I did. week? I did. Do you, how, where do you fall down there? Oh, look, I've heard people say to me, well, you're exceptional, or you're just carrying the America, you can pull yourself up by your bootstraps. Well, the fact is Tim Scott pulled himself up by his bootstraps, and uh, nobody can take that away from him. I, I think we've gotten away, maybe, uh, in America from the idea that, yes, of course, uh, slavery was a stain on America. Of course, uh, it was 19. 64 before my parents and I could go to a movie theater in my hometown of Birmingham. But never did my parents say to me, you can't achieve even if the society is against you. As a matter of fact, uh, Dana, they used to say, you have to be twice as good, right? Just go out there and work hard and you will get ahead. And if you start taking away agency, from uh, African Americans by saying, oh, the system is so stacked against you that you can't possibly succeed. What am I supposed to say to the eight-year-old? Well, don't, don't study until structural racism is over. That is taking away agency from that child. That's taking away agency from the parent that wants to put uh, that kid in a, in a good school. And uh, I really resent it. 
I resent the idea that um, African Americans can't succeed despite the challenges uh, of being black in America. Not only do you work twice as hard, you have lots of interests. Yes, I that do. That includes the Denver Broncos. Yes. And my sister Angie would love to know, can they look forward to a better season this fall? In Denver with the Broncos? Well, of course we can look forward to a better <laughs> season. I'm excited. I'm excited for Russell Wilson, who's a great guy and an incredibly talented athlete, and Sean Payton, um, our new coach. Um, I think it's going to be a good season. As you know, I kind of grew up in Denver, moving there when I was 12. We know how important the Broncos are, yes. <laughs> but I do have to say congratulations to the Denver Nuggets. Uh, yes, yes the as Nuggets, well. exactly. Yes. And, well, I could talk to you for hours. We have to let you go. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you. And for your wisdom and insight. We appreciate it. Great pleasure being with you. I'm Steve Ducey. I'm Brian Kilme. And I'm Ainsley Earhart. And click here to subscribe to the Fox News YouTube page to catch our hottest interviews and most compelling analysis.